the requirements. And so what we start with, the basis, is a theocratic direction from the governing body committees. Uh, each department will receive a template that has been established by the committees. And then from there, we will compare what you're doing here. Are there any adjustments we need to make? And then we will check with the legal department to find out if there are any legal requirements that will modify the time frames. Uh, the direction that we've received is that for records, we want to follow the theocratic direction unless there's a legal requirement that asks us to keep records longer than what the theocratic direction is. We always want to take the longer one. So we'll talk with that in depth with you uh, brothers and whoever you designate as your contacts later on. And we're going to describe that a little bit for you towards the end. But in order to help you understand who to choose to be your department contact for records management, we just want to tell you a little how the system works. Uh, it's a systematic way of handling records. But the first thing we need to do is tell you what a record is. So we have a definition. And this time I'll read the definition. I tried to remember it this morning and that didn't work. So the definition that we have for a record is information set down in writing or other permanent forms, such as images, drawings, letters, memos, emails, video clips, files, handwritten notes, and so forth. So basically, if we're recording something of what we are doing as an organization in some format, and it's going to show this is information that we're handling as a branch, then that's a record. Now, if you have pictures of the last vacation you had and you have them on your own memory stick or something and it has nothing to do with your work, that's a personal record. It has nothing to do with the organization that does not fall under records management. But the records we're going to talk about today and that we've received direction on, they fall into this definition and they're work-related records. Now, there's also another type of record we're going to talk a little about, and that's called a convenience copy. So we have a master record, which is the original, that fits that description. And then you may make a copy for a short time for some type of activity. We call that a convenience copy. And a convenience copy, you can use as long as you need it, as long as it's destroyed before the master record is. So oftentimes, that's maybe you're going into a meeting, you print out a few documents, you take them with you, or at least that's how we used to do it more now, it's electronic. But you take that with you, you have your meeting, you're all done with it, you can throw those away right away. No problem with that because there's a master record somewhere. The program we want to deal with, and that is our focus, is on these master records. So that's where our focus will be as we go through the discussion. So we've talked about what a record is. The question is, why has this come up? Why is it that we have records management now? We've been functioning as an organization for years. Well, we know that the scene of this world is changing and we know Satan's coming after us and he's going to go for us legally. We can see by the way things are shaping up. So the organization has said, we've run into difficulties in the past because of the records we have. So the coordinators committee said, we want a systematic way to handle records at all branches. And then in time, in the next two or three years, the computer department's going to start shifting all the uh, software that we use in order to match records management and the, and the program that we're going to talk about today. So for what we're looking at today, we're going to give you a general overview, and then we're going to meet, uh, ask you to pick somebody in your department, whether it's a brother or a sister that meets the qualifications. We'll see what impact that has on how this program works. And then any questions that you brothers have as we go through, please feel free to ask them at any time. That's no, no problem at all. So records management... It's not something that's really new to Jehovah and his organization. Sometimes it's new to us, but not to Jehovah. And actually, we can find a lot of the principles in the Bible for records management. So, for example, if you'd like to open your Bibles, uh, and we go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 18, we have a verse here that tells us one of the principles. That's in 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, as for the rest of the history of Ahaziah, what he did, is it not written in the book of the history of the times of the kings of Israel? Now, we've heard that term used many times, but we've never seen any of those records because those were a short-term retention. Jehovah did not intend for us to have them in our day today, so he doesn't have them in here. He refers to them, so we know that that type of record existed, but we don't have them. Now, that's a little different than... 
uh, the record that is given to us in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. When we take a look at those verses, we recognize that to be the genealogical record. So Jehovah felt it's important for us to know that we can prove the line of Jesus. So he had it recorded in the scriptures, knowing it would stay around. So that's what we call in records management world an archive, an archived record. Now in records management, an archived record has nothing to do with location. Archive is a time frame. So we're used to using some of these terms for different meanings and sometimes uh, I'll get them mixed up when I'm going, I'll try not to. But we'll say, oh, we're gonna archive those records. That means we're gonna move them to some location. But in records management world, when you say we are going to archive this record, it's a time frame, and that means forever. So that means the record that you're talking about, if you want to put it in an archive, that means 100 years from now, the organization needs that record. If they don't need it 100 years from now, you don't put it in an archive. Once you put something into an archive, you cannot take it back out of an archive, unless it's a mistake at the very beginning. But, but if you classify it as an archive, you cannot take it out. So 20 years from now, you can't go through an area, then you say, let's look through all our archived records and clean them up. Mm -mm, it's not allowed. And the reason for that is because it's all tied back to our legal defense system. If we say something is an archive, it needs to be handled that way legally, which means we're going to keep it forever. But there are some other uh, records, uh, references to records as well. Uh, sometimes folks get the idea that uh, our goal is to just go through and delete everything. The records management guys, are they got a big delete key on their keyboard and they want to delete everything. Well, that's really not what we have. The organization knows we need records. So in Nehemiah chapter 7, there's a reference that shows us that Jehovah had that thought also. That there are times when we need records for proof of matters. So we don't destroy everything. What we do is we hang on to the records we need to in order to accomplish what we need to as an organization. So in Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 5, the last sentence, it talks about the genealogical records. It says, Then I found the book of the gene genealogical enrollment of those who first came up. And I found it written, I found written in it. And then there's a whole set of verses that have lots of big tough names that we won't read. And then you get down to verse 64. So there were these entities and they were going to have to prove that they could be part of the priesthood because of their records. But in verse 64, it describes one group. It says, these looked for their records of estab to establish their genealogy, but they could not be found. So they were disqualified from the priesthood. So there are times when we need records in order to prove things. So what our oversight has determined is how we're going to handle records, which ones we need to keep for providing this type of proof, and which records we want to go away quickly. So really they've helped us to uh, understand that we don't have to make the decisions anymore. It's already been predetermined for us and by the organization. And we're going to handle it the same way at all the different branches. So when we look at records management, we're going to also talk about record series. And we'll get into that, I guess, a little bit later. First of all, let's take a look at a record. But before I do that, any questions on anything I've already said? I'll try to remember to stop, but if not, you can just stop me at any time. Okay. So... When we talk about records management, we have just a few stages to a record's life. Now that's interesting. We don't think of a record as having a life, but in records management, all records have a life. So this record, they generally start off as when they're created, and then they're stored and they have an active life. Those two sort of go together. And then there is a time when there's a review that comes up. And the branch committee is gonna give us some direction coming up soon, they'll uh, let you brothers know. But a minimum, once a year, we review records and we do destruction. Now, they may decide to do it more often. You can do it up to, up to as much as once a month. But whatever direction they give us, that's fine. We'll apply that as time comes. And then, so some records go into that archive we talked about, which is generally just a very small percentage of our records. And then the rest of them, they get destroyed at, a, at the prescribed time frame. So how does it work? Let's take a record, we're gonna walk through it. Now, we've just called it an issue, and that's gonna come up in a moment. There it is. And we just called it an issue because all of you as department heads, you have different types of records and 
we'll let you imagine what type of record that is in your particular case. But we just called it an issue. We're going to say that this issue has questions in it, and you have to answer the questions. Now, maybe the branch committee writes to you asking you for some comments or something or other. Well, like most departments, you get the questions, you go through, you create a draft, and you think it looks really good, you pass it by, or someone in your department passes it by you as the overseer, and you look at it and say, no, no, change this, change that. Well, you do a few drafts, and if you're like Justin and I, that goes around quite a few times, until uh, we look at all those that were not approved, all these uh, drafts, and we get rid of all drafts. We, didn't, we no longer keep drafts. So once we've finalized our document, we clean out all drafts. And the reason is, is because there's many comments that are sometimes made on drafts. Those are the ones that get us in trouble. Because when we comment, we tend to be a little more relaxed and we just type things and, well, we'll leave it at that. We just get rid of them. Okay, but now we've gone through this submittal process and finally we get the content approved. Now, there's a key word in that, next, in that little picture and that is content. So when we look at records, we don't care how it's packaged. It can be in an email, it could be a hard copy, it can be just an electronic document, an Excel file, PowerPoint, video clip, sound file. We, we don't worry about the package of it. But the key is the content. What is it talking about? You could have a piece of correspondence, or what we generally call the correspondence up until now, a piece of correspondence, but maybe what's being described in there is the branch committee has sent out some policy for us. So it's really policy information, it's not correspondence. Correspondence is the package. Maybe they send it to you in an email. Well, the email is just an envelope. Really, the information, the content tells us what to do with it. So the content, that's the word that you want to remember from records management. The content tells you the life of that record. It tells you how it's going to be handled, how long we're going to keep it as an organization, and what to do with it. So now we've got the content approved. Now it gets assigned to a record series. Now that term is a term we use in order to communicate with the legal world because they're used to records management, they're used to record series. That's basically, you have a series of records that, that have the same type of content. So one general record series is meeting minutes. Oh, okay, this is meeting minutes. So everything in that record series is handled exactly the same way. Records management is a systematic way of handling records, as we're, we're drawing for you here. It's a repeatable process that we will handle this type of record with this type of content exactly the same way every time. That's what we're trying to achieve. So we have different record series that are developed. And we're going to bring up what we call a records retention schedule because you'll see in the top corner it says records retention schedule. That's where the record series comes from. You will, by the time we're done, our three weeks, you will have basically a customized records retention schedule for your department. Uh, it may not be totally finalized until a little later because there's some review processes that go into play. But we're just going to take a look at this one here. We're going to pick on maintenance because, well, we like to, and that's where I used to work. So uh, <clears throat> so we have on this records retention schedule, there's a few pieces to it. One is it tells us generally what is going to be the archive or disposal date. Now, that's that either once a year or more than once a year that's going to be directed to us are given to us as by the branch committee, you will have a department records contact that's assigned. We're going to talk about the qualifications at the end of our discussion today, where you brothers will pick someone from your department to handle those records, whether it's a brother or a sister, it's okay. Now this column here are the record series. So here they have a branch related, <clears throat> and they have building related, correspondence, department related, equipment related, inventory, personnel, policies, when you look at the record series, you're going to find that they're very generic names, and that's on purpose. We want to use those generic names because our organization changes a lot. You'll even find that the description that describes those record series is very generic. There's no form numbers and form things or anything, and that's on purpose too. When we first started records management about 10 years ago, in the U.S., we got them all set up like this, and then the organization would change and adjust, and we'd have to go through and re refix all of these records retention schedules. And any time you change one of these schedules, it has to be reviewed by the legal department. So we were constantly sending them there. So the committees told us, let's generalize these, take out all the form numbers and all those kind of things. 
give it a general description. Once we did that, now we're able to use the same record series in different departments across the branch. So we still have, if you take an entire branch's worth of records, about 300 record series. But there are, some of them are very unique, and each department has some specifics that we work with. But we'll take a couple of these, and we're going to tell you there's the description here, I mean, the uh, title of it here. And then we're going to have the retention. This is how long you actually keep them. Now, you don't have to memorize all these acronyms. They're described at the very bottom of each page of the chart, so you can take a look at them. There aren't very many different ones, but there are variables that go with them. So if we go back to one of them right here, this one, safety permits, it is active plus six, and it has M-O-N, that means six months. If there is no word after it, such as this one, which is safety active plus three, that means years. So if there is no M-O-N or days, then we automatically mean years. So this is telling us that this safety permits, that, that is work permits or energy permits, you may not have that in this branch, depends on the branch, but if you do, that usually a work permit means we're going to be working on this particular area at this particular time frame. So once that's done, then it's gone inactive. It's done. The work is done. The record is, has no more active value because we've completed it. So six months later, it can be destroyed. Now this other one here, safety active plus three years, it's the same type of thing. Once that safety situation has been corrected, that might take six months. That might take a year. Hopefully not. But if it does, then once that's gone inactive, now we have to hold that for three years. So we store it for three years. You can't destroy it beforehand, and you can't hold it longer than that. So you keep it for three years after that. So you could have a record that lives for quite a few years plus that three years you know so uh, there's another one here i'm going to show you well superseded training has an s so superseded generally means that you keep this record let's say it's a policy and the policy states this well now you as a department head maybe it's a policy within your department or maybe the branch committee sends out a new policy we've seen it in the congregation they will say this letter replaces letter such and such. Well, that's the same type of thing. That's a superseded. So you take the original one, you get rid of it, and now you keep that one. Well, that policy may not change for 20 years. That's okay. That's still current until it gets replaced. But let's say you had some policies that were given to you about the buildings that were in here, and, the, and then eventually we're going to move away. Well, all those policies, if it's superseded, does that mean you have to keep them? because they're not going to get replaced, because it doesn't affect anything. Well, no, part of the definition of superseded is it, or it is eliminated. So if those are policies that are only affected, that only come into play when you were here, but now you've moved, well, you can eliminate those from the system. So we have active, we have uh, superseded, we have um, created. This works from the created date plus two years. So you may have created that on January 1st, or January 10th, this record, and it comes around and says, oh, now I've got to keep it all that year plus two years, so i got to go around another one until I can finally delete it. So you could have that record almost three years. But if you created it on December 28th, that's its first year, and then you, then you only have it two years. So some of those things in time you'll get used to. You'll learn those, how, how they work. Uh, LOE is life of equipment. So we keep those records as long as you have that piece of equipment. When it comes to buildings, it's life of the building. So we keep the records until we sell it. And then uh, life of building, I can't remember if it's seven years. Oh, yes, seven years, life of the building. So seven years later, you can get rid of those records. So in Brooklyn, we're selling all those buildings. So we're taking note of the dates. And now seven years from now, we'll start getting rid of all the records. Until then, we hold on to all of the records for those buildings. And some of them, we have had those buildings for since you know, the 20s and 30s, and we have some records going that far back. So we keep them until that time frame. So you have a record series that's records of related content get placed in that type of a series. This is how long you keep them. That's the definition that goes into them. Some departments, what they do is they take this records retention schedule and they make a department-specific document. So they may say, uh, yeah, it's department related, but that includes form numbers, this, 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 because you can change that anytime because it's not a records retention schedule. It's a document 
information form. So that's a possibility. And if you want to do something like that, you can ask us when we get with you later on one-on-one. -on -one. Any questions on the records retention schedule, please? And sometimes in a situation like that, we will look at what is the longest retention. Um, we hope as that happens as little as possible, but we know what happens. So we will go with the longest retention and you'd have to file it that if it's content allows you to put it there. Most often, well, we would prefer, and that's the way records management works, is the content tells you which record series. When you have a mixed one, you have to pick the longest one and put it in that category. But if you can split them up, that's, you know, a lot better. But we know that doesn't always happen. Another hand here, please. With regard to the, um, the example that you showed, like hot work permits, um, often we would view that as, like if we ever get inspected from a health and safety, like the HSE in Britain, which I think is like equivalent to OSHA in the States, mm -hmm. they come and inspect, it would be documents in place for health and, you know, for carrying out tasks uh, with health and safety. Uh, so would that be, uh, is that a matter for the legal department to determine how long uh, we would keep those records? Yes, what we do is, uh, you'll notice there's another column here that on our sample we don't have, but it's called citations. So what we ask the legal department to do is when they review these, they will look and they would see in there, oh, your description includes hot work permits or some nature like that. They will look up the legal requirements and they'll write the citation in there. And then they'll come back and say, well, according to the country here, uh, we need to keep those for 10 years or whatever the number is. So then we will modify that because we have the theocratic direction. But if there's a legal requirement to keep it longer, we adjust it. So, so the committees have said we don't really want the terms adjusted. But the retentions, they understand there are local legal requirements. And so we will make those adjustments as we go through, or Luke will as after we're gone. Good. Excellent questions. Any other questions? Okay. We'll go back to our life of our records. So now we know what record series we've looked and we've picked one. And we know this is where it's going to go. So we go from our records retention schedule. We've got our record series now. How is it stored? Well, in records management, Again, we don't care how it's stored. It's the content tells us what's going to happen to it. But when you store records in different formats, perhaps you have them on a memory stick or you have them in emails or hard copy or on the servers and that, however your department stores those records and uses those records, they have to be reviewed every time a review period comes up. So we had one department that had over 20 folks using memory sticks and they had external hard drives. It's a big department. They're at three different complexes in the US and they're traveling around and everything. But when they do their review, they have to call all of those in and go through every single one of them to make sure they're applying records management to it. So you may simplify how you do things. Maybe you don't have that as a, an issue here at the branch, but that's okay. You just have to know that the content of the record tells us how long it's going to live. And so no matter where it is, we have to find it at the proper time. So now a record we've got it created, we've got it assigned to its record series. Now it has its active life. Maybe it's for a presentation, maybe it's an email correspondence or something that you're sending around. All of those records have a play. <clears throat> well then at a prescribed period of the year, a minimum once a year, but it may be you're, you're given more opportunities to review your records. Your records contact in the department will come to you and say, okay, we have these record series that we need to review. Uh, if your records review period is, let's say, January, you have the month of January to do the work of the review and the archive. Now, whoever you brothers choose as your department records contact does not get any more rights than what they need to do their normal work. So you as overseers, you're going to have your confidential section. They will never see that unless you tell them they can see that. So if you have a sister doing that assignment, which the sisters are generally better at it than the brothers, um, that works okay because 
you control what access they have. But if it is a sister and she comes to you and says, okay, we're doing our review, um, you need to check through your folder to do this, um, we would expect you brothers to go ahead and comply and work with that and, and turn over whatever records need to be destroyed or you don't turn them over, you tell her, okay, I've measured this record series, and which I'm gonna to get to in a moment, and uh, this is how many megabytes of electronic files in this category I deleted. And then she just writes that down and makes a record of it. It goes on a special form that would go into Luke and the branch committee office. So as we go through it, there's that review period. Now some records are going to get destroyed. Some records are going to perhaps go into a record center. And we mean a record center just as a loose term to say, uh, it may be not on your general network. It may be a separate folder somewhere. Yeah, you could have a hard copy record center if that's required in the branch. We can help the brothers set that up. But it's a location where you can pull them aside and they're not in the, in the normal working area. Uh, you can imagine with some of the big branches, like in the U.S., where one department had two million records, if you had to work and through with all those all the time, it's, it bogs down the system. It's complicated. So that department set up a record center, and they only keep about three years' worth of current records. All the other records are set to the side. So when a question comes up, they search their general working folders. If they can't find it, then they go to the record center and they hunt through the two million records. That way, they're not so bogged down. It makes it a little easier. There are some records in a branch that will be considered vital records. That is predetermined by the committees what is considered a vital record. It's generally 1% of the records in a branch. Now, those are records that if for some reason there was a natural disaster and within 24 hours we had to be back up and running, we need these documents in order to prove it to the government. We are an organization. Yes, we are registered in this country. So you can see it's a very limited, a small amount of records. So I, many times we talk to brothers and they'll say, well, our records are vital in order to accomplish our work. But that's not what the definition is in this particular case. This is a very specific definition. And we have, the committees have determined what they consider vital records. So you'll get some training on that as time goes as well. Uh, if you have hard copy, yes, the rules apply. You have to know the content of those. Make sure you're handling those at the same time as well. And it could be that we have, as we mentioned, a hard copy record center where the records are stored for a while until their retention comes up or we're keeping them forever. If you have archived records in your department, you'll need to be in good communication with the computer department if they're electronic because as technology changes, you need, they need to help you bring all those records up with technology. We have lost records because of not keeping up with technology. Now, as I went through here, and I've talked about the different areas, and I mentioned about the different ways we store records. I don't know if you recall it when I first started. I mentioned that a record can be a film or a video, or but I also mentioned handwritten notes. Now, sometimes we think, well, you know, handwritten note, how important can that be? Well, we've found out they're very important. Uh, just a few years, well, not a few years, well, it's quite a few years ago now. We had, we used to deal with a company. We bought a particular product from them. Uh, we hadn't dealt with them in 20 years. <clears throat> well, that company got into litigation. So that company, they, in their records, said they dealt with Watchtower. Now, this was in the United States, so right away they come to Watchtower, which is Bethel. That's how they know us in New York City. So they come here and ask us, do we have anything in our records? Now, if we do, then we're connected to their litigation. That's how it works. But if we don't, then the legal world says, well, we have in no way can prove that you were ever dealing with them. They just say that. So they came to Bethel and they checked all the records and they couldn't find anything, but it was determined it would be appropriate to meet with some of those that were there at the time. They asked a few different ones. No, nobody had any records of it. They asked one brother and he said, oh, yes I do. And he was in his top drawer, he pulled out and he had a handwritten note. So that handwritten note tied us back to litigation and cost us a few hundred thousand dollars. So are handwritten notes just as important? Yes, they are. So we wanna be very careful and cautious how we handle our records, even if we think they're insignificant. The difficulty is it's happened more than once. So that's why we have this systematic program that we're putting into play. So we have the 
life cycle. We've walked through our, our record just to give you a general overview. That's what this is all about. Any questions on that whole particular process? Please, Rick. Uh, it will work in the um, document management system. Uh, it's being enhanced more. But in the next two to three years, uh, we will be putting records management into all of Hub. We just sent them our record series recently, and they're starting the design and the build of it now. So it'll go across the board, every module. Uh, but right now, it only works in document management system, and it's only a limited number of record series that'll apply. Uh, Luke? Yes, and uh, Hub right now has the ability to handle it, but we haven't asked the computer department whether it's turned on here yet, because it is built in. So you can actually assign a record series, there's a field for it, and you would pick the record series, and then it would the program will know what to do with it. But we have found when we go to the branches, it hasn't been turned on because they didn't know what it was, which is understandable, because we haven't told them anything yet. So, But that's why we're here. Any other questions? Okay, well, what we're gonna do is, um, we'll give you the bit of the qualifications and you folks can be thinking about who in your department you would like to um, have as your contact. As we've mentioned from our standpoint, if it's a brother or a sister, it's okay. We know that if it's a sister and she runs into any difficulties or pushback from anybody, and we would tell that sister that it's not a problem. She doesn't handle any of that. She just looks to you as the overseer, and that's your responsibility to take care of that. And sometimes a little encouragement from the overseer does, goes a long way with some of the folks who don't want to cooperate. We know how to talk to them. So here's how it's described. Uh, qualifications. An experienced person who is knowledgeable regarding the department's records and workflow. Good analytical skills. Effective communicator. Ability to work well with persons in the department. I think we'll get Luke to send it to you so you don't have to write it all down or anything. So that way it'll be a little easier. Responsibilities to assist in establishing records management in your department. Provides records management training for individuals in the department. Excludes records holds which I neglected to talk about so far, on specific records, coordinates the approval for destruction of department records. And that's the key point. They coordinate the approval. They don't do the destruction generally. It's whoever has access to it who does. And they work with the overseer to ensure that destruction of department records is carried out in a timely way and that certificates of destruction are submitted. You will receive an email request for the name and then it'll have that in there. We have that set up. So we've talked about the record and its life cycle. We've given you a little, little snippet to think about on that. But in here, it mentioned there's a certificate of destruction. Now that's the piece that we want to show you next. And a certificate of destruction, we have our records retention schedule. So if litigation comes up, or if the branch committee decides we want to put some records on hold, um, then uh, they can notify a department, the department will set aside those records. If it's on a hold or if there's litigation, they set them aside. Otherwise, they do a review. And the review is gonna show them that according to our record retention schedule, there's certain records I need to destroy during this review period. So they will fill in the record series title, the date range of those records, and what were they, electronic or hard copy or disks or something like that, and then the quantity, which is, if it's hard copy, uh, it would be how many centimeters of this? We use cubic feet in the US. Uh, or it could be how many megabytes or gigabytes of records. We don't need a record count. We don't need any of that. It's just a generic. We know that during <clears throat> this time period, 
there were this many records destroyed and if you're an opposing counsel and you're looking for something that has a content of this record series, we don't have it anymore because we destroyed it on this time frame. This is legal proof that we're following the schedule. So the records retention schedule is written in generic terms. This is written in generic terms. We don't want a lot of detail on here. We just want them to coincide. So you say, yes, I had department-related records, and I, they ranged from this date range, and we destroyed 150 megabytes. That's all the information the legal department needs in order to uh, defend the organization. So the whole cycle you have are the records, and then we have the review period, and they fill out a certificate. That certificate is then sent to Luke. He stores all of them for all the departments in the branch. You do not keep a copy of that. We have one isolated location where they all go but you'll have access to them whenever you need them. Did I miss anything, Justin? Oh, yes, folders. Now on the uh, H drive, personal folders. You know, many departments, um, when we first meet with them, we, uh, sometimes they'll show us their folder structure and they'll have, you know, Joe's work and John's work and so and so and so and so. Yeah, once we apply records management, we don't really allow to have folders with names on them uh, because that gives the person the impression that they're their records. Um, we don't have records that are ours that are work-related. They are all basically under the direction of the branch committee. So we are working on these records for the branch committee. We're handling our aspect of the work. So there's no personal records. So uh, we encourage departments that you no longer have personal folders. Now, whether you do any more of a restructure, that's up to the branch committee. Uh, but if not, we, in that, at least in that sense, we encourage you not to have, let the folks have personal records. Now, the overseer generally will have an isolated area, and that's understood because of confidentiality. And it may be that in your specific department, there needs to be certain specific groups with um, confidentiality against other groups. And that's fine. You, you work all of that out. There's no one structure that fits everybody. But in general, we generalize and we flatten the securities, uh, open them up a little more, and uh, we, uh, but we don't allow for personal folders of that nature. Any questions? Please. Uh, right now in Hub, um, we're basically not connecting it because it's not functioning exactly the way we want to. So at this point, we have not been including the records in Hub in our records retention schedule. Because they have they got the report built? Oh, they do. Okay. Yes, and Luke? Yes, if someone actually just pressed a physical button in Hub to do the document destruction, so at the moment we've been instructing the document administrators to do that monthly, but that will likely all change depending on the position of branch committee. So we're sticking what we're doing in Hub with the retention series for each department. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was doing the report yet, but it's to generate a report that actually looks similar to a certificate, and then you marry them all together and send one in. Yeah, please. I have a similar question because Outlook is also, I think, still destroying emails after one year mm -hmm. cycle, and then calendar appointments will also contain sometimes quite a bit of information or attachments to agendas, etc. Uh, is that going to be included in the destruction certificate, or? Mm -hmm. No, um, they, it will still destroy records on that 12 month. Every day it does its destruction. But what our training will show you is that according to the content, if you need to keep it longer than a 12 month period, you have to remove it from Outlook and put it somewhere. Because those records are going to go away. That's governing body said that's how it's going to work, so that's what it'll do. So the departments will have to remove those documents and store them either on your H drive, in hub, or some other database of some nature. Uh, it creates work, it's true, but 
that's the only way we can handle those records because uh, we're not able to make that any other adjustment to that to the outlook we do have a utility that may be allowed to be used it helps you to extract it can take emails with attachments convert them to a word document embed the attachments so that it all stays together uh, we can do some training on that if that's desired by a department we don't generally let it out to the everybody because then all they do is squirrel everything away in other places which we've already come to learn that the friends are doing so we're working with them on that so please Correct. So we would discourage that. What we have found, especially in the larger branches, people get reassigned, people leave Bethel. And we have these folders with names on them and nobody knows what's in it and they're afraid to go in there and delete something because they don't want to do something they shouldn't do. And So we've had records from folks who left Bethel 10 years before and, and we finally tell the department, you have to go through it and determine it. So if it is flattened out a little bit in the terms we use, where they put them into more general folders with no names. Uh, if you're working on that piece of equipment and somebody else is working on it, why can't you have the other person's records too? It's only going to benefit the organization. So that's how we, the departments would need to look at it. And it also depends on the direction the branch committee gives. Good questions. Appreciate that. Any others? Luke? It would fit in the same way. Uh, right now, maybe they have this folder they're carrying around to do their work, but where do they store it in the end? We would recommend it be in a general area that everybody in the department can get to, unless there's confidential information. Confidential information, we, we're sort of, we know that's isolated. But if it is general information on equipment or things like that, it would be in a general location. So they would store it there. Or if they have it, and they're the only ones that work on that piece of equipment, uh, when it comes up for a review, you know, maybe at that point, then they they maybe sit down and go through it and let the person know, yes, I have this much to destroy or I don't. It all depends on the functioning. There is, uh, there's no one way to do everything, but the principles apply in every case, no matter what the format of the record is. Please. Yeah, in those cases, we uh, encourage that the departments uh, work together and, and establish one. And one department takes responsibility, and then uh, we make sure that it is on their records retention schedule. So we have, for example, uh, in two or three of the branches we're purchasing, they have a folder where they put all of the contract information and everything. Purchasing has taken ownership of it. It's on their records retention schedule. So all that contract information is there. They can add, they can remove. Any other department that needs access to it, they have read-only rights. They can go look at the contracts, look at what they need, but they can't take anything out or destroy anything. And so purchasing takes ownership of it, even though the contracts are affecting other departments. It would be the same in the cloud. We would ask a department to take ownership, make sure it's on their records retention schedule. So it takes a bit of discussion because we, we have to think of organization-wide, not our own silo. We, we're opening up and saying, yes, we have shared documents. Somebody has to take ownership. They take ownership, and now it's recorded because we have to have a, a, a process that runs, a, a repeatable process for handling the records. So you brothers will be getting into those kinds of discussions too. You know. Our goal is not to have... Well, when we, when we started up with some of the departments in the U.S., they, this department had a set of records and this department had three-quarters of the same records as they had because they dealt with it and nobody wanted to share. And 
but we do much better now. Yeah, we're one organization. And you have to remember the branch committee owns the records, so if they say we would like you to share, then you share. Good. Any other questions? Yes, please, Jack. No, it's anything that we create or receive. Mm -hmm. Basically, anything that can tie us into, if you've received even, you know, catalogs we don't generally consider as records in that sense because, you know, the company owns them and that. But it could be that we have received documentation from outside contractors or things like that. Yeah, we didn't generate it, but it's part of our package. It becomes part of the issue as such. Yes, then we own it and we handle it accordingly. Good questions. Justin? Well, we've all had that feeling. And in the past, we probably got in trouble because we didn't have the information. So now we want to protect ourselves. Well, the branch committee understands that if it has been destroyed because of records management, they expect you not to have it. So if they ask for it and you have it, now you're in trouble. <laughs> but if you are asked for it and you're not supposed to have it, then and you don't have it, good. So the branch committee understands that. It's a change of thinking. It's a little adjustment. Uh, some folks will say to us, well, you know, we did a lot of research on that, you know, three years ago or four years ago. And if I, if according to the schedule, it says I'm supposed to destroy that. If they ask me for that again, I'm going to have to redo all that research. That's correct. And the governing body committees have said, we have found that within our organization, it changes so fast that after three, four years, it's, no, it's out of date anyway. You can't use that data. And if it's technology, forget it. After 12 months, it's out of date. So they say, yes, we understand you're going to have to spend extra time to redo that research. We want you to do it that way. So it is it's a change of thinking. It's an adjustment. Any other questions? So some think, OK, what do we do now that we walk out of this meeting? Um, some folks say, are you expecting us to go out and start deleting and cleaning up? Actually, we don't want you to do any of that. We want to wait until you get have your opportunity to have your one-on-one -on -one discussion with your contact and yourself. Um, then we can understand a little more, and then Luke will give further direction in the future. So we don't want you to start hiding things away, squirreling it away somewhere. Besides, we can find it. We have ways and means. We won't tell you, so then you won't know how we're going to do it. But it's basically, we want you to follow the program. And the governing body says, we want you to follow the program. So we want to work with you to understand it. You're going to have questions. Wonderful. Ask all the questions you can. If Luke can't answer them, he has open line to us anytime. We'll do our best to answer them. Or we can get with the legal world and sort it out, whatever the case. Or we can get with the governing body committees and ask for direction. Uh, we're here to assist. The coordinators committee wants it rolled out to the branches and we want to make it possible for you folks to do your work without complicating it. But what you will find generally is it will simplify your work. It doesn't seem like it when you're setting up, but once you are set up, it does simplify your work. It is going to also bring up issues as you start going through it. We worked with one department and one of their policies was whenever they wrote this document, they made six copies. They automatically filed one in this filing system then went over here and they sent these three to others and we said why do you do that and they said well that's the way we've always done it we've done it like that for 30 years but now with the electronic and all of that they place it in one place and they send a link and everybody who needs it can look at it if they want to look at it so you may come across the way you do things is going to start to change as you start to apply records management and there that's where you need good communication with your branch committee contact we see this problem, this issue. Hey, we see we're working with this department. Can we now start to share documents instead of all of us storing it? You know, ask those questions. The brothers would like to work that through with you. 
because they would like to have a good handle on all the records they're held responsible for. Any other questions? Please. Yeah, in the, some of the branches we've worked with, <clears throat> no elder groups keep any of those files. Once they've handled a case, a situation, they send them all to a central location, either to branch committee office or to Bethel office. Some do it in Bethel office, some do it in branch committee office. So when I work on perhaps a judicial case, when I'm all finished with it, I send it in, I destroy anything I have because mine are now convenience copies. They have the master. They keep the master. If, if now a situation comes back up with, you know, this individual, then I contact the Bethel, well, they've contacted me and said, we want you to be back on this judicial case. I ask them for the file and they give it back to me or they give me a copy. I work on it. I turn in my report. I destroy everything I have. They keep the master. So it, it all, that's where the branch committee starts to see where they can start to centralize and put information together. Please. Yes, they need to be trained as well, and they have to go through the review at the same time. So generally the contact, the department contact will set up a specific time period to review their documents when that comes. The contact may not have access to the documents, but they'll just ask them questions and how to answer those, you know, how they answer it, they'll guide them through it. But yes, because any, any connection we have anywhere, the world says you're all that's, oh, you're, you have records from that organization, you're part of that organization. Uh, that's why uh, when it comes to emailing, we're very careful what we say and how we handle those types of documents. Same with remote workers when they're connecting in. We have some departments here who have world headquarters, uh, folks working for world headquarters. Well, world headquarters handles the records when they store them on the servers of the world headquarters. But if they're storing locally, now it has to be determined whose work is that. Is it world headquarters? They better make sure that the contact knows what they have Otherwise, it now falls under the local records management. But now as we standardize across all the branches, it should all start working together anyway. Just. Very good. Any other questions? Please. One of the thoughts I knew started specifically with building rapport. Mm -hmm. um, so when the Bethel family moves to Chelmsford, the, the records will have to go and be kept at mm -hmm. Chelmsford for mm -hmm. the formerly owned properties of the organization for a determined time period. Yes. So what happens generally is you'll have to work with your real estate. There are some it depends on the country, but some uh, original records have to go to the new owner. So in a case like that, we will make a copy and take the copy with us to know what we had said and keep that for seven years or uh, whatever the legal requirement is here. Um, but whatever does not legally have to go to the new owner, we maintain those for seven years. And that's, that would be seven years from the date of you hand in, handing over the keys. That's the, that's the trigger that starts it and then you start to count whatever the time legal requirement is. And so some of that you have to work out with the real estate and legal department will let you know which documents have to go to which location. Please. Um, 
we encourage that but then again it depends on the branch committee what they would like to do so uh, I don't know if I mentioned it here we had one department when we started with them they had 960,000 electronic records and they had about 3.5 million hard copy so we encouraged them to scan them we bought them four high-speed scanners we got permission to do that it took them a few years but it is a lot cleaner now and it turned out to be great because when we moved out of Brooklyn we just picked up you know a few records instead of we had a room about this size full of file cabinets so when we were done they had about 10 file cabinets left so being mobile is something the branch committee can take into consideration uh, the way we handled it too is if it was a really large volume we bought scanners for them but in our department we have two scanners there's only two of us we don't use them but one is a checkout and we check it out to different departments because they're a special machine they cost six to seven thousand dollars us uh, the other one we keep with us and departments bring their records to us and they scan them we have it set up in a special room so we don't have to buy lots of scanners we just bought a few and we uh, work with the departments on that you have to also know are there legal requirements that you have to have hard copy of course you can't scan those but if there's no legal requirement and the branch committee decides that they would for you know electronic is fine then uh, you work it out with them if they want to if they want or have it, the budget to be able to do that this year next year whenever very good questions other questions well thank you very much brothers we know it takes a, a lot of your time to come and and we appreciate all the hard work and all of you have unique things that you're working on so it takes a little while to grasp this Luke will be reviewing a few things with you from time to time we will be meeting with as many as we possibly can when uh, while we're here in the next uh, three weeks uh, to sort this all out and get you at least a base now usually another question that comes up is how fast do we have to implement this we generally see that it takes about a year for a branch to do that so you're going to get your package get it sorted out and then as you go through your records it takes about a year to to finalize and get it going so it's not something you have to rush into uh, but you, you want to methodically work through it so thank you very much for coming we appreciate the time you've given us